Okay, I have like a relationship in order of size. So I'm going to do something a little extra. <clears throat> 10x, right? It's an abbreviation. It's an identity for a relationship between two other trig ratios that are more basic. What's that relationship? Sine on cos, right? Okay. Now, this is going to look a little like where did this come from? But stay with me for a second. I want to see how like from this line to this line, I saw, oh look, there's half r squared. Uh, no, just half r squared. There's half r squared coming up again and again. I'm going to divide through by that. Okay, well I noticed that this is, there's this sine x also coming up in two spots. So even though there isn't one in the middle, I'm going to divide by it anyway. Okay, now I'm going to ask the question again. From this line to this line, I asked you about the direction of the inequality. And I said, did it change? Your answer was no. I'm about to divide through by sine x, which it's also a variable like r is. So will the direction of my inequality change? You have to think about this one. I'm about to divide... Divide through by sine. Will the direction change? Now the answer is no. Let's write down what we get and then we'll explain why. When you divide this by sine x, you get 1. When you divide this, you get this fraction. When you divide this, you get, you get 1 over cos, right? Which is, um, I suppose you could write as sec x if you wanted to, but uh, for reasons that will become clear in about 45 seconds, there's no reason why. Um, now, why is it true that I don't have to muck around with the direction of the inequality? It's because what kind of x's am I interested in? I'm interested in small x, right? Well, for small x, like really tiny values of x, what is the sign? <laughs> What's the sign of sign? And the answer is it's positive. All the trig ratios are positive for small values of x because it's the first quadrant, right? So that's okay. So I can say, you know, since x is small. Okay, right. Now, to formally talk about this, because uh, hopefully you feel slightly awkward about using this very informal way, saying like, like small x, what does that even mean? We have language, we have notation for talking about when things get really small. What is that language? When something gets closer and closer and closer to zero, we would say? We would say, we, well, I'm going to get close to the origin, but I have like special language to do with when things get really little. Do you remember? It's limits, right? So I'm going to take the limit of every single thing as x gets really small. That would be as x approaches zero. So let's do it. The limit as x approaches zero of this will be less than the limit as x approaches zero of this which is less than the limit as x approaches 0 of this. OK. Again, a poorly designed board. Sorry, bit of a theme of my work, as you can see. I think you're OK with this diagram. You've probably got it down well and truly now, so it's going to disappear. I want you to see something. It's so cool in this, in this line here that um, <laughs> it's really bizarre, and it has a funny name to go with it, OK? Humor me. When x approaches 0, what happens to the number 1? The answer is nothing. This is independent of x. He doesn't care what x is doing. x could be turning into a rock melon. It would still be 1. Okay. So on the left hand side, that 1 is just 1. In the middle, I have this weird thing. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. I don't know what to do with this just yet, but I'm just going to put it there just like I had it written before. What happens to the right hand limit? What happens to this guy. What is cos x doing when x gets small? The answer is it approaches 1. You know what the, the graph looks like. Here it is. Here's cos, right? And no matter, whoops, no matter which side you approach from, when you get towards 0 as an x value, you're coming towards 1 for the, the whole graph, right? So this is becoming 1 over 1. Well, I'm pretty sure I know what 1 over 1 is, right? It's 1. Now, this guy here. <laughs> This cute little object, I kid you not, this is actually rather than small x being like, is that the proper way to say it? The proper way to call like what this situation is, is called, this is his actual name, the squeeze law. Um, some people, to make it sound more formal, call it the squeeze theorem, but <laughs> the fact that it says squeeze in there just makes me laugh. So what's going on? What's going on? Well, see this x over sine x thing, right? Well, it's got to be bigger than 1. It also has to be smaller than 1. There's nothing else it can do. It must be 1. 
right? Does that make sense? So if you're, if you're sort of constrained and squeezed between these two boundaries that are the same boundary, then I can infer, therefore, the limit as x approaches 0 of this thing equals 1. Doesn't just get close to 1, it actually is 1. It's constrained from both sides. Okay, now what does this mean? Well, this shows me that sine x and x, when you take the ratio between these two things, when you compare them, when you divide one by the other, they, they get closer and closer to being identical. That's what a ratio of one means. Yeah, if it's one to one, we have the same amount of whatever stuff we're talking about. Okay, now I'm gonna leave it as an exercise to you to try and work out how can I come up with a similar sort of argument using all the same foundation we've just set up to show that x and tan x also do the same thing. They also, the x divided by tan x, or tan x divided by x, it all goes toward 1 because um, the reciprocal of 1 is 1. So you could turn these upside down and it would still work out quite nicely. Okay? So the last thing I'm going to do is just show you, because some of the questions will, will ask you things like this, what happens when these things don't quite match up? So just as an example. What if I have the limit as x approaches 0, we'll do a simple one first, of 2x on sine x. Now that's not x on sine x, is it? But it's so very close. What can I do with this to make that look like what I just used, what I just established? Yeah. I can factorize the 2 out. Russell's exactly right, because just like here, the 1 is independent of x. That 2 is also independent of x. It doesn't care, right? So I can bring it out the front, like so, and then say everything else is exactly the same x on sine x. But I know what this is equal to. I just proved it, right? So this is 2 times 1. I'm going to ask, I'm going to insist on you actually writing the 1 there and not just saying 2 because it indicates I've just done something with this object. It contributes nothing in terms of multiplication, but I, it's, it's equal to something, okay? So that's equal to 2. What about if I changed it to be this? x on sine half x. What would you do with that? Because again, they don't match. Hmm. I want the top and the bottom to have the same angle, right? I want them both to be going small x. They're not the same right now. Can I change this easily? Like, can I just factor out the half? I can't, right? Because sine, cos, tan, trig functions aren't as easy and neat as that. So if I can't change this easily, maybe I should change the top one, right? Well, it's quite easy to turn that into a half, even though it's not right now. If, for example, I put a half there, you can't just multiply things by, because you want to, right? But I can balance something out that would give me the same result, right? I would put a 2 at the front, because 2 times a half is, is the original question. Yeah, that's what you started with. So that's also equal to 2, because now there's a half x there, half x there, it's fine. Okay.